Hi, I'm Matt Lentz, and this is joint work with Victor Aday, Parjad Aditya, and Peter Drushel out of MPI, as well as Elaine Shi and my advisor, Bobby Bhattacharji, from the University of Maryland. So mobile social applications provide rich user interaction based around users' contextual information. Now this information includes their location, their current activity they're participating in, as well as nearby peers around them. So for example, Google Latitude allows you to share your location with all of your friends, and FireChat provides a platform for ad hoc messaging between nearby peers. Commonly, these are implemented via some centralized service. Applications on the user device simply present a user interface and collect sensor data to upload to the service. The service then processes and this aggregate information in order to potentially match and connect users together. So here we have a trusted third party because this contextual information is sensitive in nature. Now, alternatively, there are device-to-device -device communication means for doing something similar. So these applications implement the entire service on the devices themselves and use short-range wireless radios, such as Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, in order to communicate with nearby devices. While this avoids trusting a third-party service, it does introduce the threat of tracking by adversaries through the use of either static network identifiers, such as network addresses used in communication, or potentially deterministic protocol state. And this is not some fantasy. For example, we saw in 2013, smart trash cans in London actually tracked users as they moved around the city based on their Bluetooth address and device name. So you can think, okay, well, let's just randomize these addresses, create some ephemeral pseudonyms for the device, and we can avoid this tracking problem. That's true, you get unlinkability, but at the same time, users also want to recognize each other for interactions in these mobile social applications. So today, I'm going to be talking about SDDR, our secure device discovery and recognition protocol that seeks to provide a privacy-preserving building block for these mobile social applications and their interactions with nearby devices. So first, I'll begin by talking about our secure encounter primitive that basically just outlining its utility and security properties that we want. Next, I'll propose a straw man protocol that implements the secure encounter primitive and demonstrate that while we can use existing cryptographic techniques to actually achieve the security properties, it's difficult to get the energy efficiency that we need at the same time. Then I'll go into formalizing our system goals and then introduce our SDDR protocol, which achieves high energy efficiency by actually encapsulating device discovery, recognition, and key exchange in a single, non-interactive broadcast message. And finally, I'll go through some points of evaluation from our paper in terms of SDDR and talk a little bit about concurrent work that builds on top of the secure encounters that we talk about here in SDDR. So first, secure encounter takes place between a pair of co-located devices that discover one another through the use of these short-range wireless radios. And during this encounter, they want to establish a shared key between them in order to secure communication through untrusted channels, both during as well as after an encounter takes place. And for example, they could use pseudonymous email for this purpose. Now, it's important, as before with unlinkability, that this secure encounter is unlinkable by default. And this means here that a peer should not be able to determine that a, another peer is connected with a specific encounter, nor determine whether two encounters actually relate to the same peer. Now, at the same time, recognition is important, and peers may want to recognize for a variety of reasons, whether they're friends or work colleagues. And they want to do this while remaining completely unlinkable by all others, whether adversaries or just other people. Now, this kind of recognition is really the mapping of the ephemeral pseudonyms or the addresses that kind of change over time to prevent tracking to long-lived identities such as the peer's name. And of course, when we're talking about re recognition, it's also important to consider revocation of this right. So users may want to revoke this right of recognition simply because they're no longer friends or for temporary friendships such as between us researchers here at the USENIC Security Conference. And also, recognition, or rather revocation, can actually enable more powerful forms of recognition through things like context-based scoping of recognition. And so in this case, you can allow recogniz recognizability by individual friends using these context-based constraints that rely on users' ever-changing contextual information in order to adjust recognizability. So for example, Bob may only be willing to allow his work colleague, Alice, to recognize him while he's at work. 
uh, but for his friend Charlie, he's willing to only allow him to recognize him at night. And it's important across these use cases that revocation is both efficient and unilateral. So efficient meaning that we shouldn't have to uh, communicate or rekey with every single one of our friends the second we revoke one of them for recognizability. And unilateral in the sense that we shouldn't actually have to communicate or cooperate with the remote peer in terms of revoking revocation, or in terms of revoking recognizability. Now, I just want to go through a summary of these security properties for secure encounters. First, we want to discover devices while preserving user privacy. Second, we want to enable secure communication between these encounter peers. And finally, we want to recognize peers with whom the user has prior trust relations and support efficient and unilateral revocation of this right of recognition. Now, before going into see how we kind of map this primitive to an actual protocol, I'll talk about the threat model a little bit that we consider. First, we trust the operating system and any apps installed on your phone not to actually reveal identifying information about you to other users. Second, we do not consider any physical layer attacks, such as RF fingerprinting, which typically rely on sophisticated receiver hardware. And finally, we assume that user devices simply participate with all nearby devices, and some arbitrary subset of the, these devices are controlled by colluding attackers. Now, in order to make this more real and get to a protocol, let's take a look at how we can enable recognition. So users could agree on some shared secret value, which we'll term the link value between these two users. And this link value could be potentially based on a previous encounter, such as using the hash of the shared secret that these users, um, from the encounter that these users had before. Now, using these link values, users maintain state in terms of two sets, the advertised set and the listen set. And so here we'll take a look at the blue user. For the advertised set, he inserts link values which basically say he's willing to allow green and purple to recognize him. And for his listen set, this basically says he just wants to recognize the green user. Now, revocation is pretty simple. You simply just remove the link value associated with the user from the advertised set. And in this case, they're revoking purple's right to recognize blue. And green sets up their advertise and listen sets similarly. Now, with this, we have these advertise and listen sets, so how do you enable recognition? Well, it's a kind of conceptually very simple. You just intersect the sets. So here, we exchange the advertised sets between the users and use the listen set as local information in order to compute the intersection. And here, because the green and blue users were recognizable by, an, by each other, they both have their link value as the uh, intersection result. Um, so we know how to do intersection in crypto, use private set intersection. And so we'll see that here in our straw man protocol. First, the users simply perform a Diffie-Hellman key exchange in order to establish that shared secret key as part of the encounter. Next, they'll perform the private set intersection using the advertised and listen sets as before. And in this case, again, they do determine that their link values are at the result of this intersection. And this allows them to map whatever ephemeral pseudonym the device is currently broadcasting in terms of its address back to the recognizable peer with whom they have a prior trust relation with. Now, this strongman protocol, or this protocol in general, has to run frequently. We want to discover and encounter all nearby peers. So in a room like this, we'll have to form hundreds of, of encounters with all nearby devices. And so the protocol must be fast, for example. However, we see that PSI is prohibitively slow on some of these mobile devices. So we're taking a look at computation time on the y-axis versus the size of the advertise and listen sets we're using on the x-axis. And this is for the JL10 construction of PSI running on the Samsung Galaxy Nexus. And for reasonable set sizes of 128 or 256 link values, or friends you want to be recognizable by, this takes around or over 10 seconds of computation time. Twice it must be performed for each execution of this protocol. And when you scale to this number of users, when you want to form an encounter between every pair of users, it's just infeasible. So instead, we have to go back and look at exactly what system goals we want. We need efficiency. It needs to be practical for these resource-constrained devices, not only in terms of processing power, which is minimal, but also in terms of battery power, because they're not always plugged in. And also, it must be scalable. We want to handle situations where we have many nearby peers, such as a football stadium or this conference room. 
And these goals really highlight the need to develop this kind of secure protocol with energy efficiency as a first order goal, not something you just try and tack on later within the implementation when you already design the security. And now before we get into the SDR protocol, let's talk a little bit about the state each user maintains. So we first divide time into discrete time epochs across which the user is unlinkable. Within each epoch though, we maintain some of the state. And this state corresponds to a Diffie-Hellman key pair, which we use as before, like in PSI, to generate the shared secret, as well as a Bloom filter. Now a Bloom filter is a probabilistic set digest that hashes set values into a bit array. And we use it for the advertised link values. And note that we use it for compactness property, not for security such as in garbled Bloom filters. The security from our approach is actually derived from the time varying hashes that we'll see in a second, which are used as items to insert into the Bloom filter. And in our paper, we provide a full formal proof of security in our appendix that you can see. And now, given the advertised set, as well as the public key, we'll see how we enter entries in this Bloom filter. So we solve them using the public key that it will change every epoch, as well as using the link value as the actual quantity we want to hash. And this marks the appropriate bits in the Bloom filter. Similarly, we do this for the orange user, the green, or sorry, the link value associated between the green and orange user, and that forms the entire Bloom filter except that we also need it to not be linkable in terms of the advertised set size, so we determine some maximum size for the advertised set, and we have to pad entries up to that size. Now these two components form what we call the broadcast beacon for our protocol that users will send out. And so this is the kind of beacon that encapsulates device discovery, recognition, and key exchange in just a single message. And we'll see how that plays into power efficiency in the evaluation later. So now that we have this broadcast beacon at both users, let's see how the protocol actually plays out in practice. So the blue user will broadcast out their beacon, and the green user receives it at some point in time. Now, in order to process this beacon, the green user relies on their Diffie-Hellman key pair, as well as the listen set of link values that they're going to be using. And so, first of all, they perform a local computation to generate the shared secret key corresponding to the encounter. And then they start querying the Bloom filter included in the broadcast beacon from the blue user according to the link values in the listen set. And this is using the public key from the blue user as the salt for this hash computation. And here we see that the blue user can be mapped to this encounter because the bits are set. And yet when we check the orange user, not all the bits are set in the Bloom filter, so we don't map them or associate them with this encounter. Now, like I said before, Bloom filters are a probabilistic set digest. So you will and can have false positives. Now, we provide ways of mitigating these false positives, as well as talk about ways to get the Bloom filters to converge to the exact intersection quickly during the actual epoch, and the details of this are in the paper. Now, at the end of this, the green user has formed an encounter with the blue user, and likewise, the blue user will do the same once they receive the green user's beacon in the future. Now, in order to evaluate SDDR, we had to implement it. So, we did an implementation on the Android operating system using Bluetooth 2.1 as our underlying communication medium. And we developed and evaluated this prototype implementation on the Samsung Galaxy Nexus smartphone, and we used the BATOR power monitor for all the power measurements that we performed. Now, we returned to the system goals in order to help guide our evaluation in terms of both the efficiency and scalability of this approach. And we see this graph that we saw earlier in terms of PSI's computation. And now when we add SDDR to the picture, we can see that we're way more efficient. And actually, we're faster by over four orders of magnitude um, in terms of computation. So this helps with scalability. Now, beyond just how much we're using the processor to compute recognizability, we also want to take a look at energy efficiency because all these devices are battery powered. And here we have these SDDR versus PSI power traces that show power consumption over time. So on the bottom, we have Diffie-Hellman plus PSI, and on the top, we have SDDR. So on the bottom, we have this discovery portion, and this corresponds to the point in time where the Bluetooth device is actually going out and trying to find nearby devices that are discoverable. And then for the Diffie-Hellman plus PSI straw man, we have this recognition portion, which is performing the uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange, 
as well as the PSI-based recognizability protocol. And this recognition is performed for each single user you discover. So right here, we discovered one user, and then we performed this straw man protocol. And so you can see how much time and energy this consumes. And later on, we had an incoming recognition from someone who discovered us. Uh, now, when we take a look at SCDR, we see that, well, there is really just no recognition protocol uh, outside of this. It's actually tied right into discovery. And this is uh, partly due to the non-interactive protocol that's in the, that's a kind of allows this um, energy efficient implementation. So we're basically ha we basically have an invisible footprint within this Bluetooth discovery. And so, like I said, this cheap non-interactive protocol really enables this low energy implementation. And this uh, discovery and recognition protocol. Um, is able to play non-interactively using the extended inquiry response uh, specification in Bluetooth 2.1, which we discuss more in the paper. And now besides these two things, we also take a look at more detailed evaluations in terms of power micro benchmarks, as well as how we scale in terms of battery life versus number of nearby devices. And in addition, as I mentioned before, we had some concurrent work that we did in order to take a look at how we can use these secure encounters for other things, such as providing a communication platform. So we made Encore, a system that appeared in Mobisys 2014 this year, that supports content sharing for groups of socially meaningful encounters. And so here you can see the encounters on the bottom of the screen that we determined via SDDR over time. And Encore tries to use additional contextual information to tie these together and allow groups of participants in these events to share content, such as this picture taken during a reading group meeting as part of the live deployment at MPI. And we welcome you to go visit that paper and look around as well. So in summary, mobile social applications have significant privacy challenges. And by considering energy efficiency as one of our first order goals in design of the SDR protocol, we can provide this secure encounter primitive, yet run efficiently on these mobile devices. And I welcome you to visit our website below to follow the project, EBN for encounter-based networking at large. Um, and at this uh, website, you can also find our code to download, to use, and also to replicate our results. And I welcome any questions at this time. Thank you, Matt. Your questions, please. All right, I've got one. Uh, why, is it, why was it so important uh, that all of the computation happened just on the mobile devices? Did you consider any kind of outsourcing? So I think that uh, it's kind of like twofold. First of all, you can offload to third party services. However, I guess you end up having this energy constraint by using um, kind of the internet uh, or like cellular slash Wi-Fi in order to connect to an access point to do all that. And if you want to deal with encounters all the time, which is what we're trying to form, um, that would provide like a huge overhead in terms of energy budget. Um, and so by doing it all on the device and by designing like a, a cheap protocol to do so, we are able to avoid that. So 802.11 and LTE are, are more expensive? Than oh, for sure. When you're communicating with a third party service, not only will that take more time because you have latency constraints and you're communicating with either an access point or remote tower, um, but Bluetooth is made for uh, very low power local communication. Anybody else? All right, thank you, Matt. Yep.